Hello, this is Brendan Wall of GameItAll.com with another edition of Film Talk. We have here today a uh, producer, I guess producer, writer, director, done many, more many different hats, uh, Princeton Holt. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you, Brendan. Glad to be on. And, uh, yeah, so mainly we're talking about today uh, the film Alienated, which was released uh, last year, I believe. No, that's uh, – I, that, I guess technically that's when we started the uh, film festival circuit. So that was when the first – that's the first – last year was the first time an audience got to see it. Uh, audience has got to see it on the film festival circuit. But the release is actually this month, um, March 31st, um, and we're, we'll be in six cities uh, theatrically. Um, uh, this month as well. Boston, March 25th through the 31st in Boston uh, at the Somerville the uh, Theater. And uh, we're waiting to confirm other locations now uh, in venues um, that aren't confirmed yet. We're sort of pulling our hair out trying to finish that stuff up. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, because... I think I think uh, over at the at uh, IMDb it just kind of says when you first started releasing it I guess. Yeah, I guess technically they can they can call that a release because people begin see, uh, seeing it uh, on the film festival circuit. And uh, which, which cities are you taking it to this month? We're looking at we're just trying to lock down New York, LA, uh, DC, um, Aberdeen, South Dakota, and Nashville. Okay. Yeah, we're trying to lock those in. Boston's a lock, um, and that's been announced. IndieWire actually announced it either this morning or last night. I can't remember. I don't know when it when it started when they posted it, but uh, that's Boston is uh, March twenty fifth through the thirty first, as I said. Okay, and for people outside those cities, are you do are you planning on going uh, video on demand afterwards as well? Absolutely. Uh, you're in Canada, for instance, and uh, Gravitas Ventures picked up our North American rights. So people in uh, America and Canada can see it on the 30, uh, beginning of 31st. Uh, 30? And pretty soon, I think they should be, I'm waiting to hear back from Gravitas, but pre-orders should be available really soon. So people can pre-order it, and we really encourage people to go over and get their pre-order on because that really helps us out in pushing the uh, visibility up. So definitely. But 30, the March 31st, you'll be able to see it I, everywhere, iTunes. Amazon, um, uh, Google Play, YouTube, <laughs> on demand, um, you name it. Uh, I would even oh, and cable, uh, cable video, uh, video on demand as well. Okay, okay. So March thirty first, guys. That's when you get uh, get your hands on a copy. You can also pre order Amazon, iTunes, pretty much everything. I right? Google Play. <laughs> yeah, everywhere, everywhere that uh, you can get video on demand. Everywhere except Netflix. Okay. <laughs> yeah, people don't understand uh, that that aren't, aren't aren't in this, but Netflix is your last your last destination. It should be your last destination because then everybody has it for free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I don't even think that net we're even dealing with Netflix uh, at this point. So it's going to be a while off if it even goes. Uh, if we even deal with Netflix, uh, so the distributors know that that's their last. That's usually the the final frontier because everybody's getting it for free on Netflix. So. Um, we're everywhere but Netflix, I can say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would think like like Netflix is great and everything, but I would think that you'd get you'd get significantly less uh, <laughs> money from that. You know, you're absolutely right, Brendan. It's like you make a you make a movie, and people think, oh my God, Netflix, uh, because the the name the brand is popular. But if you made a movie and Netflix gives you five grand and takes it for three months, or I'm sorry, three years. What kind of a deal is that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, the acquisition prices are dropping significantly, uh, significantly because they now concentrate on original content. Um, so they're concentrating more on series. So there's it's not it's no longer great for the filmmaker uh, that just has one film because then it pops up on there. They give you their you know your little uh, acquisition price uh, for for the rights to play it for a couple of years and that's it. So. Yeah, but Netflix is great. I don't want to bash Netflix. But <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but not for not for everybody. Not for everybody. Um, okay, so many uh, many forms of, of availability there coming up at the end of March. Now, just to go back a bit, um, go back in time, mm -hmm. when you uh, first started to get involved in film, because you're the producer of this film, Alienated, right? Uh, yes. So when you first started to get involved in film, what, what, what would you say is the first 
kind of aspect that you wanted to go into. Wow. Okay. That's that's a good start. <laughs> uh, I was when I went to film school uh, in New York. The 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 professors got up and told me. Uh, they told the class, some of you, most of you are whatever you came in here for. So so if you came in here for screenwriting, you'll pro- there's a good chance you'll leave wanting to do cinematography. If you came in as producing, you probably could leave as writing. Like it just goes back and forth. Um, most people entered film school for, to be writers and directors. <laughs> so everybody wants to be a director. Uh, and I was no different um, after being just heavily influenced by – by films that I saw through the years. Um, one film just literally picked me up and <laughs> literally picked me up and put me in film school. Uh, and that movie is Magnolia by Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, that, that movie spoke to me in such a personal way um, that I, I, I just thought about it for a week. And then I, um, afterwards i just it just it just stayed with me so i'm like i gotta see that again i don't know what i saw <laughs> i don't know exactly what i saw but something is pulling me to see this again and i saw it again and I, that was it uh and so i went right to film school after that but when i was you know to answer your question um it's it was writing and directing that sort of started it for me okay yeah no magnolia is fantastic yeah oh my goodness man it's amazing. <laughs> would, would you think? Do you think that's his? What's your favorite Paul Thomas Anderson film? Is it that one, or is it like oh, There man. Will Be Blood? Uh no, it's probably Magnolia. Over there will be blood. Nice. There's a. Yeah, I don't think he's made like a bad one though. Really. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. No. But hopefully never. Fingers, fingers crossed. Yeah, definitely. So would you say he's your favorite filmmaker then? No, not. I, but at the time, he definitely was. Um, okay. It fluctuates. I'm probably sure you can relate to that. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. It goes up and down. Jeez, <laughs> uh, I'm Scorsese. Not these days, dude. It's like I pray to the the altar of Scorsese again. You know okay. what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a huge Scorsese guy. Yeah, that makes that that's that's a good choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> now you said you start, now you have done some writing and directing as well. Uh, most of your credits, uh, most of your credits seem to be on uh, like a, in a producer role or executive producer role. Yes. Um, now there is a lot of misconceptions about what producers do. I find. Mm-hmm. Now on a on the in the role of an independent film, uh, kind of explain like what exactly the producer's role is because I guess you know some people think. They think they hear producer and they think like it's basically the director. Some people hear producer and they think it's the money guy. Mm-hmm. So it's like you know, what, what exactly does that uh, come down to? You know, you're right. People don't know the difference uh, outside of the industry. People don't know the difference between writing, directing, and producing, or or directing and producing. Um, directing is is everything creative. <laughs> um, producing is everything creative, everything business, everything managerial <laughs> uh producers take the take the bullets and stand take take the bullets and shield the director from everything <laughs> uh so that's and producers are who people come to when they have issues or if somebody's not happy with something we we're the ones that get the calls first uh so it's a very thankless job but basically it's uh it's a situation where we from the beginning take a film through from development uh, through pre-production, scheduling, hiring, uh, casting, crewing, uh, production, um, post-production, on through uh, distribution, and even some people even after release. It's just, you just stay on the film the longest. Um, Sometimes you're handling the money, you're making sure that uh, money's raised, budget, budgeting and all that. So in this case, in the case of Alienated, uh, we were at a we were we were sort of at a space where it was time to do our summer movie. We needed a we were going to do a summer shoot, uh, and Brian and I were sort of juggling different log lines. And one in particular stuck out to me, which was this one, which is you know, uh, and we can I know we get in more, get more into it, but uh, I sort of threw threw out the log line to him and pitched it to him, and I basically asked him what would he do if he woke up one day and looked up and he saw a UFO in the sky, and he just he just thought about that's the one he took that's the one he sort of took to, 
um, and came back with the script. So in this case, I, you know, we have a list of log lines that we use. So I felt like this one was one of the three that I felt like I wanted to do. I wanted to sort of, uh, that would be good for us. And Brian, uh, this is the one that he took to the most. So in this case, I did start as early as story concept. Now, now for this film as well, um, you were saying that the when the log line came up, now about a, a guy waking up to see a UFO, because that's what I that's what I basically heard about the plot before watching it as well. But it turns out to be a much different film than you'd expect. <laughs> um, is that something that? was planned right off the bat. Like it was going to be more about the relationship between the two leads or. Yeah. 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 Brian's Brian's nuts, man. He's, he's nuts. He, this is his take on his sci-fi or sci-fi genre. And that's what some, some uh, writers and critics have, have, have called it. Um, luckily, um, the ones who liked it and most of them have, of course, people are, you know, everybody's going to have their, their, their sort of different criticisms, but, yeah, it it was his take on it and his his understanding of the, our limitations, right? Uh, hidden in terms of even being in the house uh, for the entire, almost the entire film or most of the film. Um, yeah, what I had seen, um, I saw another Earth, um, but I hadn't yet seen Coherence. Have you seen Coherence? Uh, no, I don't believe I have. Coherent is this really another small film that's shot in five days uh, that was just five people in a house uh, and then a comet. It was the night of a comet passing, um, okay. and it changed the dynamic and sort of strange dimensional things started happening, but they didn't leave the house, and so he had to be extra creative. I saw that afterwards, uh, after we had already finished Alienated, but I was able to compare it to that, and it, it did really well independently. And I, that, that sort of gave me the um, confidence that this could, that this might be something that distributors and, 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 and audience would, would like, audiences would like. Um, but it is, it's a take on the genre, um, I, I think. I think it's a mixture. They, it's been called a mixture of um, something like Signs and Who's Afraid of a Ginger Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's sort of like it's sort of like a it's a sci-fi, but you also get a bit of like art house in it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. He he could care he clearly could care less about the event itself. Uh, he he just pushed the event to the background, whereas yeah. most sci-fi films, it's about the event, and then oh yeah, you get some characterization sprinkled in. Brian was like, you know what? I'm go I have the nerve to think that this relationship and the nuances of it. Is even might even be more important and, and uh, catastrophic than the world it made. So, <laughs> well, and I gotta say, like the 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 two characters, the arguments they get into and stuff, it's it, they they ring very true. Like it, they all, it sounds like very very familiar stuff you hear or you experience like all the time. Right? <laughs> we we were, we heard that from uh from audiences at festivals. Uh, we heard that a lot. People felt like uh, it sounded very true to their relationships. Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe except like you know maybe not the UFO part, but everything else. <laughs> a lot of other things. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and then we were surprised. It plays. I think it. I always felt that it plays differently um, on your small device than it does in a, with an audience. You know, and and in, when you when we so, when we've shown it to audiences, um, there's a lot of laughter, <laughs> right? And uh, sometimes. Lots of lots of laughter. There was a couple of times we looked over. We were very surprised, and we were scratching our heads, like we didn't make a comedy, did we? Like, why are people laughing so hard? Uh, <laughs> he said, uh, and so we, we, as we asked, we were bold. We just asked, asked the we asked the audiences straight up, like, hey, why, why, why were you guys laughing so much? We're we're flattered. We just want to know why. And everybody's, you know, that was the response was, hey, this is felt like something I've said before or a conversation that I, me and my wife or my, my husband and I have had before. Yeah, no, for, for sure. And uh, and also, like, uh, there's uncomfortable silence. There's uncomfortable moments, like, where you kind of you kind of feel uncomfortable for, for either, you know, him or her. And uh, that kind of creates that, that sometimes creates laughter, too. Right. It's like it's like the same thing if you're watching a horror movie and everybody gets scared and then everybody's laughing right after. Oh, yeah. So like the where you just where it's the uncomfortable silence thing sort of. Going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or uncomfortable yeah. moments and then laughter sort of releases that. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good that's a good point. 
That's what I found anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. I appreciate that. That's 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 cool. I mean, any any reaction is good. I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As long as long as you keep them in the theater, you're good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Except getting up and leaving. That 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 reaction is not good. <laughs> um. Okay. So yeah, I was gonna say I, I was gonna say it also kind of resembles a. To me, it also kind of resembled a play. Like I think if this was a play, I think it would work just as well. Wow. You know what, Brian wrote a play version not not long ago i think maybe like a month ago oh really where he, he, it was like this was my this was the vision that i had out for these characters you know uh so he sort of did both he he, he satisfied it he satisfied the film from an audience standpoint but then he he, he satisfied i guess the the uh purpose of a film and thinking about an audience um to the best of his ability for, for the film and then he satisfied himself as a writer by writing the play version. So I think uh, we're, we're toying with, I know he wants to release that later uh, and see if he can get it produced, but yeah, it's very much like a play um, in that sense as well. Just like, you know, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf was. Yeah. I mean, cause there's, a, there's mostly one location. There's a, there's like two, I think there's maybe three mm-hmm. other one, like three in total. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I probably should uh, should mention this too. I, I can't go without mentioning this uh, on a kind of a kind of a sad note. But uh, you all, this all this film was also the last appearance for uh, the late uh, Taylor Negron. Yes, yes, it was. This was his last film, um, and you know we we were bummed out about that, as a lot of the rest of the world was. Uh, yeah, and I didn't know it until um, until later. So. People have told me, "Hey, this, I think this is the last his last film." So yeah, I think he had he had a couple of things in the works. So he had something, I believe, in pre production um, that he was attached to. But this ended up because they never went to production. This ended up being his last on on screen appearance. Yeah, he was he was phenomenal. He passed a cancer last year uh, in January. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a shame. Uh, so how how was what was it like working with with him then on this film? Amazing. Uh, he was very thankful. Well, it, well, I should back up and sort of tell you how we got how we got um, involved. Oh, sure. This yeah. wasn't this wasn't even supposed to be like our. I will say this: this he he was. We were talking to him about something else. <laughs> okay, uh, that we thought we were going to make first. And that he was just one of, I'd say, maybe he was one of maybe three or four people we were talking to about another film that Brian was that Brian wrote. That's a, that that script is incredible too. Um, and he was sort of really, we were talking to him about that. And then what ended up happening is we had to chuck that because it was too expensive. It was more than what we were, we were prepared for. Um, and so when we when we went down the list, we have a list of people. Uh, you know, that you can, that we can get to without going through their agent. Uh, and he was on that list and we were, you know, he was a couple, he was one of two people that we were considering and uh, we reached out to him and he was, it wasn't an automatic at all. This guy is a professional. He's been, he was a professional with so, he's been through so many films, so many Hollywood films that he does what they do. He, he, he um he does what any professional would do he considers the script <laughs> first yeah. yeah so uh you know we made the offer and then we sent the script and he goes well let, let me think 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 on it cuz obviously it wasn't a whole lot of money you know <laughs> yeah so um you know so he it was it was going to be based on the material it's going to be based on his on his script i mean based on his um his character and the material itself and i think what he responded to was he loved the material um, he loved his character a, a lot, and um, but I I think that as an actor he understood that this was a rare dramatic role for him. Um, he had played a bad guy in the bad guy in uh, the Last Boy Scout, um, but he you know it was sort of you saw the you saw the Last Boy Scout. It was that character was supposed to sort of be uh, over the top. He was supposed to be the bad guy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> So sure. there wasn't a lot of nuance or not. It wasn't a huge arc. You know, it wasn't like he decided to be bad at the movie or he changed it. <laughs> he, if he, he was bad at first and he wanted to change his life and be good. No, Hollywood doesn't do that. Uh, they don't do that a lot. So he's the bad guy. And I just, even though he wasn't, you know, he wasn't um, really comedic 
uh, he wasn't sort of, it wasn't a comedy performance or a comedic performance. Um, it still wasn't, I don't think, as nuanced, uh, and it didn't have the humanity that this one had. And I think he just responded to doing something a little different. And so it was a rare dramatic role for him. And, uh, you know, he, he responded to it and he said yes, um, after, but only after he read the script. Okay. And then you had, and then you had him on the set and he was great. Oh my goodness. He, we, he, he invited us to his house, uh, the day before shooting so that he and the lead actor, George Cat could read. And so we just had like a rehearsal period there and Brian just sat on the floor with the script and just laughed and he, he was so, you know, was, they, that, that was a real fun time. He made us breakfast. Uh, he was just out of this world, literally. Okay. So uh, <laughs> he, he sort of, Taylor told us in no uncertain terms that day when we were over his house, he said, you guys may just be making a movie. Um, and I, you know, that's great. The script's great. He goes, but I actually believe this. Uh, and I'm like, whoa, that blew us away. He believed everything he was saying. He believed what the movie is about, and that's just how he lived. He told us he believed in ghosts. He believed in, in aliens, he, and he felt like he had experiences, and, and he could feel certain energies and spirits, you know, um, and he really felt that. And so that, for him, made it even more personal. And then the next day, he was just ready. He was ready to work. He was early, and uh, he was great to work with. He had he told incredible stories. He made us laugh a lot. <laughs> Uh, he also was serious uh, uh, occasionally as well, uh, and then he was very gracious, and uh, he wasn't he wasn't difficult. He didn't demand anything. And when we were finished, uh, I'll never forget it. When we were finished, he said uh, he 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 wrote me and he said, "I just wanted you to thank you guys for taking such good care of us." Um, and that really just sort of this guy had been on huge movies, and for him to thank us. Uh, like that for taking care of him, you know, like this, he's had huge trailers and I don't know, hors d'oeuvres and huge buffets in front of him. And, you know, for, for him to feel like we took good care of him really meant a lot to us. So yeah, he was amazing to work with and to know. Yeah. And he's phenomenal in the movie and uh, you guys should definitely check that out. Uh, the two lead actors are also very good. I wanted to say, I, I don't think I've seen them in anything else before, but they were, uh, I'm sure they have it in other movies, sure. but I, I just I haven't seen them in anything. But for our first first impressions, they were really good, and they had they seemed to have like a real chemistry between them too, which is unreal because they had never met each other until two weeks before shooting. You know? Oh wow! I mean, it's <laughs> crazy how this thing worked out. But um, it's that's to that's all them. That's to their credit. Um, uh, Brian chose. I gave Brian a list. Um, again, there we are. We big on lists. We we just know a lot of people, and a lot of people reached out, and and quite frankly said that, you know, told us, made themselves aware, made made us aware of them and um, have told us, hey, anything you got, we'd love to work with you guys, uh, no matter what it is, blah, 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 blah. Um, but in their case, we had a, we, they were on a, a list of actors that were in the area. And I felt, I gave Brian a very short list that they were on and um, he, he selected them. Um, and then the first question is, uh, well, how are they going to work together? And, and we had no time for formal rehearsals. So, that that was Jen Barry and George Cat just deciding to get together on their own, um, and they just they just huddled up and they worked for they just met at a coffee shop and they just worked and just read and read read for two weeks and they they uh, it's unreal and then they to shoot 116 pages in in five days I mean is just incredible so we were we were shooting at, at a rapid pace we were doing. 15, 20 pages a day. Wow. Which is like, you know, it's like speed racing. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, and they pulled it off. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think, it was, I think it was just, they're just two great actors. And, uh, and when you have two great actors, these sort of tightrope acts, these impossible, um, feats are just easier when you have professionals like them, you know? Well, yeah. And with a small budget and with the amount of, uh, the, the speed at which you have to go through it, I mean, there's not a lot of room for error, right? You don't have a lot of you don't have a lot of you know fourth, fifth, sixth takes. <laughs> no, you're right. And and they, and what's crazy is that Brian wasn't shooting a lot of them, um, so there was not a lot of there weren't a lot of takes at all. Um, there were some there were some moments. The the moment one of my favorite moments in the film is when uh, George is playing as Nate tells Paige that he's what he saw. And he tells her, you know, when he that moment when he told her when he what he saw. I remember asking Brian when we were recording the uh, DVD commentary track, 
um, in Boston. I remember asking him, hey, I always wanted to, I know we've been touring with this movie for a year and a half, but I always wanted to ask you, how many times, I, I don't remember that day, how many times did you shoot that? And he told me we shot it, we shot it twice, but I only needed it once because <laughs> he had already nailed it. Now that's a pro. OK, so wow. that's a pro. He, that moment, he was already he knew exactly how to read that line. Uh, he, he almost said it matter of fact, matter of factly. He, uh, I love the way he delivers that, that, that news to her, what he saw. You know, uh, a lot of actors, I think, would have been <laughs> would have been tempted to overplay that. And he he, he underplayed it. Yeah, no, it, it, it does. See, it, it is very uh, like the acting is very subtle and uh, underplayed. Uh, for sure, and if, yeah, if you had someone doing over the top in this kind of movie, it would just it would be a weird fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, now, we, now, now we uh, we took the battle of the movie, and we definitely don't yeah. want to do that. So kudos to those two, George and Jen. Uh, they were and are amazing. Yeah, uh, Jim Carrey circa 1995 probably would not fit. Uh, <laughs> you mean the mask would not work uh, in this <laughs> or? or uh, Ace Ventura. No. Yeah, no, I think Fire Marshal Bill would have been a bad fit. There you go. <laughs> um, now, just going back for a second, just to back, back to uh, what you're saying about producing. There's also been some uh, some of your stuff you've produced and directed uh, at the same time, correct? Yes, yes. So now you said that the producer kind of has to act as a shield, sort of, for the director. Now, how hard is that to do when you're doing? Both of those things. That might be the best question that I've been asked <laughs> on this on this press tour because it's so loaded. Um, I had to learn the hard way. See, the direct as a writer director, you have to keep the morale on the. I mean, anybody as a producer, if you're directing, the morale is, of, of 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 your set is very very important. Um, but when you're directing, you you want the you want to encourage the uh, the the sort of atmosphere of creativity, right? Um, you don't want to, it shouldn't be antagon, antagonistic or anything like that. Um, you want to encourage the best ideas um, that you can. Um, and so there, <laughs> you, you have to put up with everybody else's self-interest um, as a director and let it and sort of, and sort of flow with it, right? Um, and as a producer, your job is to protect the movie. Um, and protect your director and protect the integrity. And more importantly, a lot of the part that people miss is you're protecting a lot of the legal, uh, the, the, the legal um, and corporate interest when you're dealing with the release. So as a director, you're only thinking about the creativity and the bond that you have with your actors on set. As a producer, you have to protect everything and you have to do things for the better, betterment of the movie. Um, and the problem comes in a lot where you're dealing with people, people who have their own self-interest, right? You're thinking, oh, this is one of a bunch of movies that we have coming forward. But somebody who was hired uh, to, to work on a film is they don't know when their next, they don't necessarily always know when their next uh, work is going to be. Uh, and so they want to maximize on that, whether it be screen time, whether it be, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, marketing materials. So when you're dealing with both of those together, they're they're mashed together. It's a it's crazy, you know. <laughs> it's uh it's it's mind numbing um, because you have to wear two hats. You have to be the director, which is the friend, but then you have to be the businessman when you're producing, which which is which is not a friendly game at all. Um, yeah. And so the, it, it's a it's a sort of a schizophrenic um, period of your of t of time. And I got to tell you, I don't know. I think um. I've I've had horrible experiences doing both, uh, and then I've had incredible experiences doing both. Um, so it, it's sort of if I've, I honestly, if I had my choice, producing would be what I would do the most, which is what I do the most now. I produce yeah. a lot more than I direct, as you can see, um, for that very reason, you know. So. It's a uh, it's 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 tough, man. It's tough. The, pro the director has to be the friend, and the producer has to be the businessman. Yeah, like you said, it's like a schizophrenic thing, right? <laughs> oh my god, I don't know how some. I couldn't do. I could not do that a lot. If I had, to, there's sometimes we have to do it, and that's why you've seen uh, us have to do it, you know. But what I want with Brian, if I if I'm directing, a, my, my dream would be to have what Brian had with Alienated, where he didn't have to worry about 
conflicts and, and disputes or any of that kind of stuff and all this paperwork and any of the money stuff um, and just create, you know what I mean? That would be the perfect thing, but the perfect sort of case scenario for me to write and direct. Uh, I know that, you know, that, that's not going to happen though, because I became a producer uh, to, because I, I became a producer because I wanted to, that's what I always wanted as a director. I wanted somebody to have my back, you know what I mean? And fight for the integrity. I wanted that. And I sort of, I had to become, that person didn't, that person never came. I, there were a lot of people entertained. There were a lot of projects that were, you know, people came, uh, whether I had written them and I was going to direct them, um, that, you know, they came aboard and they were producers, but I found myself doing everything. I couldn't wait around for them, you know, for years to raise money um, and put the crew together, any of that kind of thing. And so I just sort of had to learn that side of the business out of necessities um, okay. and become what I always wanted uh, to, to, I always wanted in a producer, I sort of just became that, you know. Yeah, no, um, yeah, because you see a lot of, like, a lot of independent films, uh, the, the crew often does multiple things. It, it, like, you all, it's not it's not rare you see a director also producing, so, I mean. I know, man. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it is, it's almost out of necessity. I mean, budget reasons, too, right? Oh, yeah. Yep, yeah. budget budget the same. You have to do both. I personally think it's uh, it, it can be detrimental sometimes. Uh, I think yeah. the best case scenario is to have a director be able to at least while he's produce at least while while production's happening, um, have a have a, a director should have the luxury of being able to have somebody take that off their hands. I think. Well, and I mean, if you want to look at a big example, uh, a wildly different results. Uh, look at someone like Kevin Costner, right? Okay. He directs and produces a lot of his own movies. Okay. Sometimes it could be, you know, he gets like Dances of Wolves, mm -hmm. and sometimes he gets Waterworld. You know? <laughs> <laughs> or, or that's a good one. That's a good one. Look at Woody Allen, um, who has made a lot more hits than he's made uh, misses, in my opinion. Um, yeah, he, for sure. he, he has somebody take care of take care of that for him. He he has that. And then you got Spike Lee, who has a strong, who's one of my favorites, by the way, just like Woody Allen is. Um, and Spike is a personal hero of mine, and he has a lot more misses because he's wearing most of these hats. Um, he yeah. has to wear all those hats, and so he has a lot more misses than he has hits. Uh, so I think that's another example, too, of two people who can sort of, um, you know, who sort of do both. I mean, do all of it and just do one one thing. And uh, Woody Allen, Kevin Costner, <laughs> and and Spike, you know, those are those are all different examples of some kind of some some of the results you can get yeah spike spike poor spike's getting older too <laughs> yeah yeah you need to start you need to start hiring some help I think. <laughs> well he blew me away with his last one it was so divisive but i loved it i saw it twice um he blew me away with chirac and i heard amazon was thrilled about it too that's why they put it out in so many theaters for so long um but then his last two god <laughs> Like those were just that I, I was broken hearted when I saw um when I saw I'm not even gonna say the name of the movie but it, one of his last ones just really that that, that, that was a, my wife had to console me I was I was heartbroken <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think I might know what you're talking oh, about. <laughs> yeah there we go so yeah I think you may know. So I guess the last thing I'll ask you then, uh, do you have anything uh, coming up soon or that you're working on right now that you want to kind of mention? Um, our our focus is, yeah, there are things that are happening, but right now there's nothing happening but alienated. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, and that's just, we literally, you know, department at the company shut down just to release this movie for this month. So a lot of press, a lot of good stuff. Um, the, but right now, honestly, the, the, the theatrical engagements, getting all that set up, um, and then sort of keeping up with all of the press surrounding it um, is where our focus is uh, right now. And that's basically that's trying to lock in the five cities I mentioned. Uh, Boston is a lock for you, for you, those of you in the Boston area. Um, Boston a lock from March 25th through the 31st at the Somerville Theater. And then our VLD release is uh, March 31st. All right. So I want to uh, thank Princeton Hope for stopping by chatting about Alienated and uh, some of his experiences producing and directing at the same time sometimes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, thank you very much for stopping by. Thanks for having me, Brendan. I had a good time talking to you.